if I were to ask you, what will the last days, the Bible calls the last days, be like? What would you immediately think of? If I said, think of verses, think of scriptures that describe the very last days, which scriptures would you, would you think of? I think most of us would think of as in the days of Noah, or we think of as in the days of Lot. And uh, certainly Genesis 19 describes a society of depravity and perversion, and uh, we see that happening more and more in our society today. When we hear the phrase, as in the days of Noah, that the last days, according to our Savior Yeshua, Jesus, as in the days of Lot, what do you typically think of? Yeah, we think of depravity, like I said, unspeakable violence. We think of days of perversion. We think of perhaps even genetic um, manipulation that might have been going on. There were giants in the, in, in the land in those days of enormous size. They were the men of renown. We'll read those later on. Uh, but was all the violence, all the perversion, all the sin and the continual evil in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot, the only things that we were to think about, or were those the things that even were being focused on by Jesus when he said, the last days will be as in the days of Noah and the days of Lot? We'll see. I think certainly they're going to be very evil. I'm not saying our assumption or our thinking that it's pointing to the evil of those days is wrong. I'm not saying that. But I think there is something actually that Jesus focuses on that we don't tend to focus on like we should. So, for example, well, anyway, so hello, everybody. I'm Philip Shields. Welcome to Light on the Rock, where we try to really focus on our relationship with our God and relationship with one another. A lot of love uh, relationship, if, if at all possible. So if I said to you, let's get back to that question, what do you think of when I say, as in the last days? I think many of you will think of Somewhere in the Bible, in the New Testament, Paul talks about there will be perilous days, perilous times in the, in the last days. Yes, that's 2 Timothy 3. I'll put, put it up here. 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 5. That's not my focus today, but I just want to show you there are descriptions given in the Bible of what the last days will be like. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 5, yeah, it talks about perilous times. It, it talks about verse 2, men will be lovers of their, of their own selves, of themselves. Lovers of money. Absolutely, that's clear. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful. We've been talking about, by the way, thankfulness lately. We've been talking a lot about holiness lately. Unholy, unthankful, unloving, unforgiving. We'll talk uh, about forgiving uh, one another as well. And how if we, are, if we don't forgive one another, we're, we're not going to be forgiven. A few of you might even think of another place where the last days are mentioned as a description. And there are actually uh, many, many uh, verses that talk about the, the day of the Lord or the last days. But, but I'm just picking out a few. Genesis 49, verses 1 and 2, before he died, Jacob, who was renamed Israel, got his 12 sons together. And Genesis 49, verses 1 and 2, he says, basically... Let's put it up here. I, I'm going to tell you what's going to befall you in the last days. And one of these days I'm going to give one or two sermons about where are these 12 tribes today. They certainly are mentioned in the Bible. They certainly are not lost. There is no way that Israel, that Jacob could be talking about what will befall you in the last days, as it says up here. What, we're, what will befall you? Unless these are nations and countries that we know of today. Anyway, that, I don't want to get, boy, I can get off on that very quickly. So others of you will know another verse, 2 Peter 3, verses 1 and 2. He talks about there, first of all, when Peter says, I just want to, I want to write another letter to you, another epistle, and remind you of all the things we've said before. And then in 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4, he says, Knowing this, that scoffers will come in the last days and when walk according to their own lusts. And they'll be saying, where's the promise of his coming? Everything's good. Now, look at the wording here, by the way, because we're going to come back to the words of Jesus and where he absolutely shows it looked very normal times when the very end happens. 
and saying, where's the promise of his comings? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Everything normal is going on. Well, that would be a great start if you listed those passages. 2 Peter 3, Genesis 49, and then the one in, in Timothy. Um, what was that one? First, 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 5. So it's a great start. But I still think most of us would revert back to the statement of Yeshua, our Savior, that the last days will be very much like the days of Noah, the days of Lot. So let's turn to Matthew 24 and let's read one of these passages. I think the other one's in Luke 13. Matthew 24, verses 29 to 35. Immediately after the tribulation, the great tribulation of those days, that's seal number five in the book of Revelation, the fifth seal, Revelation 6, immediately after the great tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, stars will be falling from heaven, powers of heavens will be shaken. I think he's talking, when he says stars will fall from heaven, he's actually probably describing uh, hits by asteroids or near misses. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Matthew 24, verse 30 now. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then he'll send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, so he's talking about the very last days. His coming, his return. And he mentions something next in verse 32. Matthew 24, 32. Learn the parable of the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it's near. Know that my return, know that the setting up of the kingdom of God of the messianic reign of it, at least here on earth, for a thousand years, is about to happen. It's at the doors. Luke 21, the parallel chapter, Luke 21, 29 to 31, says, know that the kingdom of God is near. Now, let's go back to Matthew 24, and we'll jump to verse 36. Of that day and hour, no one knows, not even his angels in heaven, but the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Notice how it says my Father here, not, not always just the Father. I gave a sermon about calling God and, uh, your Father, my Father, my Savior, my kingdom, my heavenlies. You know, it's yours. Take, take ownership. But as, I hope you hear that sermon, but as the days of Noah were, so also, here it is, verse 37. Let's look at it again, Matthew 24, verse 37. As the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating. Does that appear normal? Normal? They were eating and drinking. They were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Now, I want to bring your attention to something here. He does not say, as most sermons out there about the coming of the days that the, the last days will be as the days of Noah. He does not say, but as the days of Noah were, verse 37, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For He does not say, verse 38, for in the days of Noah, they were doing genetic manipulation. There was some, there was some strange behavior going on between the sons of God and daughters of man. Their thoughts were evil continually. Violence filled fill the earth. Perversity filled, every, filled the world. And, and that's the way it's going to be again. He doesn't say that. What he says in verse 38. Now what I've just said is what everybody thinks of. That's what I hear in other sermons about as in the days of Noah. But what he actually says is that it's going to look very normal. People are going to be marrying and giving in marriage. Until the day that Noah enters the ark. 
So I ask you, is there anything wrong with eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage? Now he's saying everything continued normally, basically is the way I read it. Or so it seems. If uh, we look at the same thing in Luke 21, uh, he, says this, he says the same thing there in Luke 21. They were, building, they were building houses and so on. Now Matthew 24, 39, and didn't know. All right, they're all getting married. They're building houses. They're, going, they're, they're living life as normal in their violent, evil ways, no doubt. I'm not, I'm not saying it's wrong to say that about the days of Noah. I'm not. But don't miss what he actually said, is what I'm saying. Didn't know, they didn't seem to have a clue, in other words, until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now let me ask you again, what was Yeshua focusing on? Was he focusing on the evils of that time? Was he focusing on the giants and the, and the genetic manipulation that could have been going on? On the constant violence? These things were happening, yes. And the last days will include those things, yes. But what was his focus on? He was focused, now listen, they didn't have an idea at all until the flood came and took them all away. He was focused on the fact that it all wrapped up really quickly. In fact, as I speak, I think of a verse I should have put in my notes here. Peace and safety and then sudden destruction. Sudden, sudden destruction. i make a note of that to put in the notes that I give all of you. There was something very, very positive, though, about the flood, the ark, the days of Noah, and I'll come to that. And I want to make sure you point, uh, that, point that out. I hope we've learned how quickly, though, with this coronavirus, how quickly things really, truly can change. Literally, it seemed overnight. We here in America and in Europe, especially here in America, we here in America had a booming economy. Unemployment was at a three-point-something all-time low. Uh, employers were saying they couldn't find enough people to fill the jobs. And we were booming. And then literally within a few days, almost overnight, everything went the other way. So I hope we're learning that, yes, the virus should have woken, awakened all, awoken, awakened all of us to the fact that things can change really quickly. Now let's pick up in Matthew 24, verses 40 and 42. He went on to say how suddenly the return was, and people are going on with their everyday jobs, apparently. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, and one will be taken, the other left. I'm in Matthew 24, 42 now. Watch, therefore... For you don't know what hour, in, in, in Luke it says the, the day nor the hour, and I think maybe even later here it does. You will not know what hour your Lord is coming. Who's he talking to? He's not talking to the general public. He's talking to his very own closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, and so forth. That's who he's talking to. He says, you, you, you disciples, or you, you end time disciples, won't know. For he says later on that I'm going to come at a time you think not. And you're thinking, no, it can't be then. That's when I'm coming. And when you all got your prophetic time charts all figured out, when people show me their time chart, how, especially if they put dates on it, sequence of events I can take, but dates on there, I start saying, well, okay, I know one more month and year it's not going to be because he comes at a time we think not. Then in verse 44, he says to be focused on being ready. We'll read that in a second. Having that close relationship and a bond with Christ and your Father in heaven. Don't focus on getting ready, but being ready. Don't be focusing on saving up a lot of gold or food or having escape hatches. It's about knowing your Savior. It's, a, it's not about plotting all your prophetic timelines. He says in uh, Luke 21 to watch. And in Matthew 24, to watch. Now in Matthew 24, 44, again, therefore you be ready. Don't, don't be trying to get ready. Be ready now, all the time. You see, my end time and your last day, is a next, it could be one heartbeat away. Your next conscious moment will be with Christ. 
at the resurrection or in judgment. So it's coming at an hour, Matthew 24, 44, at an hour you don't expect. So several things here. Yeshua does not, does indeed say it will be like in the days of Noah. He does say that. It's going to be just like in the days of Noah. So what do we do with that statement is my question here. We decide, we, uh, so we, let, let's go find out what the days of Noah were like. So that's what we do. So we go back to Genesis 6. We'll start posting these up here. In Genesis 6, verses 1 and 2, it came to pass when men began to multiply. and Daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw the daughters of men. They were beautiful. They took wives, whoever they chose. And so whatever's going on here, Ye Yehovah is not happy, apparently. Uh, this marrying and giving in marriage is not making him happy. Let me summarize quickly the next few verses. Verse 3, God felt that he was had been striving with man, perhaps through the preaching of Enoch, for example, and others, and uh, fighting against humanity. My spirit shall not strive with man forever, verse 3. Verse 4, there were giants, and God gives 120 years. There were giants on the earth, verse 4, in those days. And afterwards also, and the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men of renown of old. Okay, verse 5. This is the part we all think about. Then Yehovah saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's pretty bad. When all of your thoughts continually are evil. The wickedness of man was great. And then going on to verse 6, And Jehovah was sorry that he'd made man on the earth. I think King James has repented God to do that. He was sorry. He was grieved in his heart. So Jehovah said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, man and beast, and so on. But verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of God. So when Yeshua says, as in the days of Noah, does he even mention any of the things we've just read at all? He mentions it'll be as in the days of Noah. Were those things going on then? Yes, absolutely yes, they were going on. All the things I've just read, it was. Absolutely was a very, very evil time. And absolutely, I agree that the very end time is going to be very, very evil, like the days of Noah in that way, but that wasn't his focus here. He never mentions sons of God. He never mentions the thoughts being evil and all that. Instead, instead, Yeshua's warning was on how suddenly, how quickly, that's what he was focusing on, how quickly, and how unexpectedly everything wrapped up. This China virus we have, this uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, it's going around the world, I think should be a wake-up call to all of God's people all around the world. That no matter what we do, how quickly, how suddenly, how powerfully, how dramatically everything can suddenly change. That was the focus of what Yeshua was saying. And there's going to be a very positive angle in here that I'm going to dwell on as well. Give me time. Turn now to Luke 17. We'll see the same thing when Lot's mentioned in Luke 17. Luke 17, verses 26 and 27. As it was in the days of Noah, which also shall be in the, in the days of the Son of Man, they ate, they drank. Nothing wrong with that. They married wives. They were given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. We just read how it came upon them suddenly. They were caught by surprise. Likewise, Luke 17, verse 28. Likewise, it was also that way in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. Every day, day by day, human activities. But on that one day, early in the morning, on that one day, everything was fine the day before. Early the next morning, that day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Suddenly, abruptly, everything's going normal, normally in the city of 
Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zeboam and Zoar, the five cities of the plain, all of them were destroyed. It wasn't just Sodom. They were all, especially the other four cities, Lot wasn't even in there. They were all, I think Zoar, I think Zoar was the one that was actually spared. Uh, before he, Lot thought he might want to go there first. But even so, so it will be the same way when the Son of Man is revealed. Yeshua goes on, but once again, does he decry their violence, their greed, their perversions, their evils, their selfishness, their injustice? As it mentions in one of the chapters in Ezekiel, it goes, it goes through all of those. That was all there, but not what Yeshua focused on. His point is this. God will hear his people. As he heard Noah, who found grace with God. Remember Genesis 6, verse 8, I think it was. Noah found grace. God hears his people. God knows his people. God knows where they are, even in the most dangerous of times. And God takes care of them. As things get tougher and tougher, more and more evil, wilder and wilder, you and I will be tempted to worry, tempted to wonder, where are you, God? Can't you see all these things going on? And the answer is, so I'm giving you in this sermon, he knows you, he knows where you are, he knows what's going on. You can relax with that, but don't misunderstand me. I totally agree that we're watching our society turn into Sodom, turn into the days of Noah. In fact, just recently, Washington State in America passed laws, just recently, that now mandate that children age five and up will now be taught in school, graphically, with depictions, with drawings, with pictures, with instruction, all about sexuality, all about fornication, all about having babies, all about homosexuality, all about transgenders and transgender and homosexual parents and the depictions and the pictures I'm told if they were talked about or displayed by adults to children outside of a classroom, those adults would go to jail. Parents in Washington, I hope you speak up or pull your children out of public school altogether, as one of my daughters has done with her children, educating them at home school. And they're all way ahead of their, their age and grade level. So yes, that evil will continue. Yes, in New York State they passed a law, was it last year or something, about no law can be uh, prohibit a woman from having her child aborted to shed innocent blood all the way to the point of birth. State of New York. And then they all applaud. Not they all did. The, 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 the Democrats who voted for it in the majority all applauded that horrible, horrible, violent law. I think Virginia is similar. I think. So yes, it's getting worse and worse and worse. When we can open up certain businesses and call them essential, when they're marijuana stores, liquor stores, when we can open up casinos and call them essential in time to open up, but hold back on churches and church meetings and religious services. Thank God President Trump finally just said, I want the churches opened up. I don't even agree with all the teachings of some of these churches, but that's not the point. We are continuing to take God and throw him out of our society, prohibit him from being discussed at work, prohibit him from being discussed and prayed to at school. And then we wonder why we're having all the problems we're having. Yes, it's getting to be like the days of Noah. But the point Yeshua was making was it's going to look very normal, every day going on as normal, and then wham, the end comes. So anyway, I hope you all will take good care of yourselves, be close to God, be ready. In Luke 17, verses 31 to 36, In that day, he who is on the housetop, and his goods are in the house, let him not come down and take them away. Likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. There's coming a time that you'll finally be aware, 
boy, this is it. Don't even go back into the house to get your jacket, to get your laptop, to get your cell phone. You won't watch your cell phone, frankly. You really won't, because they'll use it to track you down anyway. Or to go back for anything in the house, or anyone in the house, or your pet in the house. Don't go back. Remember Lot's wife. Remember, she looked back. She was told, don't look back. Whether she looked back to turn back, as it implies, and why she'd want to turn back when she was seeing destruction happening, I suspect that she had loved ones there, other children, other grandchildren, that she wanted to try to pull out of there. Pets, maybe. Servants. Friends. I don't know if she wanted to run back into a burning city, but maybe like people will burn into a burning house if they think one of their children's in there. So I don't, I'm not harsh on her, but we're not, we got to remember there's a point where you just say, I can't, I can't go back. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you in that night, it talks about men in bed, and one taken, one left, two women grinding, one taken, one left. Men in the field, one taken, one left. His focus, again, is on the suddenness. Suddenness that we're taken away from the scene. Now, so be ready to move. Be ready to act. Now, here's part of the positive look. I, I think some of us are not going to remember this, and we're going to go back. We're going to try to pack. We're going to try to bring everything. Try to, where's my cell phone? Where's my laptop? Uh, where's my dog? Where's my cat? Has to remember what he says here. Don't go back when that time comes that it's that sudden. It might be a tidal wave where some of us live that we realize this is it. We got to go. Anyway, now here's part of the positive look at the days of Lot and Noah that God's people are remembered by God. God's people, our God remembers his people, his children. And protected by our God, at least he knows who they are, who we are, and what's happening. Although he does seem to let quite a number be martyred. As that's taking place, as you're being martyred, if you're being martyred, or even hurt or tortured, remember he sees, like Stephen. God allowed Stephen's eyes to be opened to see Yeshua standing on the right hand of majesty. When God... The Son of God stood up, stood for a mere mortal to honor him. Stephen took encouragement from that. Father, he said, Lord Jesus, don't lay this to their this sin to them. Don't, don't do that. Forgive them. And I commend my spirit to you. As he was dying of rocks and stones crashing on his head. Hold that thought. He knows you're there. Now Peter adds something else. Let's go to Acts 2. He's quoting from the book of Joel, chapter 2. Acts 2. He, uh, this was spoken on in the day of Pentecost. And on this day, 120 people had assembled together for the Feast of, the feast of Pentecost. And it says that the Holy Spirit came and lit on every single one of them. And every single one of them, including women, every single one of them spoke in other languages. And I know it's including women because Peter brings out the fact that even women, maidservants, will prophesy. Well, let's read it in Acts 2. They were asking him, what's going on? So Peter gives his sermon, an impromptu sermon. He's inspired to speak on this on the day of Pentecost, which is a few days away as I record this, end of May of 2020. So on Pentecost Day, when the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God himself comes into us, his very own part of his very own being comes into us. Acts 2, verse 16 to 18. We're actually going to go on all the way to verse 21. This was what was spoken of by prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. 
Peter thought the very last of the last days was right then. But in fact, when you think about it, that was 2,000 years ago, a, 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 a thousand years as a day. It's as a day to Christ, to God. And so in the last days, the last two days, yeah, we're in the last days. But in the very last of the last days, the very end times, it wasn't yet. But he says here, it's a prophecy for us to remember that in these horrible, horrible, horrible times that we're going to come into, very dangerous and awful times, we can take encouragement for the fact that our God is going to pour out his very essence. He's going to pour out a lot of what he himself is, his spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And he's probably pointing around to the young men, the old men, and the women, and the men servants, and the maid servants. And on my man servants and maid servants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. The word prophesy could also mean to speak under inspiration, as they certainly were, no doubt, doing. On the maid servants and man servants. And I'll show you signs and wonders in heaven, verse 19 now, and signs in the earth beneath, and blood and fire and vapor and smoke and so on, the moon turning to blood and the sun and all that, before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Verse 21. Here's the, another very positive angle about looking at the, as in the days of Noah. It says in Genesis 6, 8, that Noah found grace. Let's post that up there again. Genesis 6, verse 8. Noah found grace in the sight of Jehovah. If Noah found something, he probably was looking for it. He was seeking God. He was calling on the name of Jehovah. He was calling on the name of the Lord. And whoever shall call on the name of the, of the Lord shall be saved. So when these rough times are happening... Remember that. He, he's, he's pouring out His Holy Spirit. Let God's Spirit flow through you in these times that are coming up ahead of us. Maybe, maybe a lot quicker and sooner than maybe I even thought. I'm thinking, I have thought for a long time now, that it's going to happen probably in this decade. I could be way, way off. I know that. But whatever it is, again, my last day, days could be my next heartbeat. I could die right now while giving this. So we have to be ready. We have to have that relationship going. We have to be close to God. We have to be calling out on the name of the Lord. We shall be saved. Asking him to pour out his Holy Spirit. Yeshua himself said, do you want more Holy Spirit? Ask for it. We'll give it to you. So God's Spirit continues to pour out to those who will call out to him. That's the great news of Pentecost. That's the great news of as in the days of Noah. That's the great news is as in the days of Lot. We could be seeing, as part of the good news, a good angle on this day, some or enough people of the church of God, enough people of the con congregation of the righteous, we, of the enough people of the children of the Father, the men and women who are filled with God's Holy Spirit, calling out to Him, full of God's Spirit, doing mighty works, getting answered prayers, if we will just... Believe and get out of this Laodiceanism that we're in. This lackadaisical sleepiness that we're in, that I get into. Yeah, I do too. I have to repent of slipping here and slipping there in my thinking, in my actions, in my lackadaisical lack of zeal. I, I, I've got to do it too. Our God continues to save those, even in the Great Tribulation, to call out to Him. Let's turn, uh, turn to, uh, eventually, if you can, in your Bible there, Revelation 6. There's still so much positive that can be said and done. Before we go to Revelation 7, where God does set apart hundreds of thousands of people, let's just do a quick rundown leading up to Revelation 7. The first part of Revelation 6 speaks of the first four uh, seals and you know we, the false prophets and the wars and the famines and the pestilences the first four seals and the death everywhere uh, those may have already been opened these first four seals and it's going to get work you know as in a scroll that you open it once you open it it stays open and as the scroll is unrolled some more it gets more and more profound and longer and longer worse and worse then we come in Revelation 6 verse 9 
verses 9 to 11. Let's put it up here. Um, Revelation 6, verse 9 to 11 is all about the great tribulation, the great martyrdom, the great persecution against the children of God. Many will indeed be martyred. But let's read part of it here. Revelation 6, verse 9, Then he opened the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the soul of those souls of those who had been slain. All of you who think you're going to be raptured and go to heaven, that all of God's holy people, or none of them are going to be killed, you're wrong. It says right here that this represents the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. And it says in Matthew 24, we just read it, that after the tribulation of those days, they shall see the sign of the Son of Man after the tribulation. All of you who think you're going to be raptured up, then you go argue that with Christ, because he says the gathering of his saints to him in the clouds is after the great tribulation, after the signs in heaven, after all of that. So the fifth seal, Revelation 6, 9, is about those who are slain, and they figuratively or whatever say, How long, O Lord, holy and true, before you judge and so forth and avenge our blood? And then they're given white robes and they're said, you got to wait. There's still more to be killed. There's still more to be killed. The end of verse 11. Would be killed the same as they were. Would be completed. Then after the great tribulation, and then after, now you come to uh, verse uh, 12. I looked and he opened the sixth seal. And behold, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black and as black as sackcloth of uh, hair. And the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. The sky receded as a scroll. And when it was rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. The kings of the earth, the mighty men, the great men, the rich men, all were terrified. They would run into the rocks of the mountains. And they, verse 16, they said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us from the wrath. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Verse 17, for the great day of his wrath, the day of the Lord, for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand. So now the great tribulation has been going on. God's people are being persecuted, are being killed. I do believe some are taken to a place of safety, but another mistake that you Sabbath keepers, Church of God folks make, is that you look too much to the place of safety and not to the source of safety. God our Father and Yeshua your Savior. That's no better, that's no different than Protestants who look to the rapture instead of looking to Christ. Will there be a place of safety? If you want to see what I think about it and preach about it, Type in and go to the home page and type in. Maybe we can show that. Go, go to the home page. There's a search bar. There's a search bar right on the home page on the right side that says search. And you just write in there place of safety and it will pop up. I think in Revelation 3 it talks about the Philadelphia group and, and how they can be spared from the time of trial that's coming upon the whole earth. But anyway, don't make that your goal. Make your goal. Paul said, my goal is a place of safety. No. Did Paul say his goal was not to be beheaded? No. Did Paul say his goal was to quit being persecuted? No. Paul said his goal, Paul said his goal was that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I want him, I want the resurrected Jesus living in me. I want to be a witness to his resurrection in the sense that people can look at me and know that Yeshua of Nazareth was resurrected, or else why is Paul so different? He was out here killing people, persecuting people, torturing people, condemning people to death who were of this Christian faith, and now he's the biggest proponent of it. They must have seen Christ in him. <laughs> they must see Christ in you and me. So there's a terrible time coming ahead, like Revelation 6, we've just read, the fifth seal and the sixth seal. Sixth seal is a heavenly sign. It's going to terrify everybody. Then we come to Revelation 7, part of the good news of Pentecost. I mean, I mean the, part of the good news of the days of Noah and the days of Lot. In Revelation 7, verses 1 to 4, 
four angels standing ready to start really inflicting some real pain on the earth. And then verse 2, another angel comes down, ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. He cries out with a loud voice to the four angels, Wait, wait, wait! The tomb has been granted to hurt the earth and the sea, to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Don't! Don't stop, stop, stop! Don't harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So these were, out. I know a lot of you think you know what the 144,000 or who they are. All, and some of you think it includes people from the day of Abel all the way to the last one converted at the very end, filled with God's Spirit. Abel's dead. He doesn't have to be sealed. He can't be harmed by whatever the angels are going to do. Noah's dead. David's dead. Peter and Paul, they're all dead. But some of you think the 144,000 includes all of those. If there's a parallel 144,000, maybe so. But I'm saying this is describing people who are alive after the end of the fifth seal, after the end of the sixth seal. And they have to be protected. That's the good news of as in the days of Noah. That God apparently looks down and he sees 144,000 people, 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. Some of you think that's spiritually. Some people, I don't think it's spiritually because we come to verse 9 and he's talking about people from all the other tribes and nations and ethnic groups who are also mentioned. But this is Israel, 12,000 from each tribe who are sealed. Verse 3, don't harm the earth, the trees, and so on, until we've sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. The number of them was 144,000 for the children of Israel. Okay, we come to verse 9. After these things, I looked and behold a great multitude, more than the 144,000, way more, which no one could number, of all nations, all tribes, peoples, tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God. Remember, Yeshua's name means salvation. Belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders of four living creatures fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might to be, our, to, be to our God and forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders said, Who are these? arrayed in these white robes, who are an innumerable multitude. You can't even number them. And I said, he basically says, I have no idea. I'm sure you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of great tribulation, washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These are people who, during the great tribulation, repent. And God hears them and sees them forgives them, washes them in the blood of the Lamb. That's part of the positive angle of as in the days of Noah and as in the days of Lot, that our Father and our Savior sees what we're going through, hears our prayers of repentance, asking Him to, I know I should have done it years ago, but I'm doing it now, I'm repenting. And I want my sins all washed away in the blood of the Lamb. You read the rest on your own, verse 15 and 16. The Lamb, verse 17, who's in the midst of the throne, will shepherd them and lead them to living waters, living fountains of waters. Remember what he said in John 7, All you who thirst, come to me. Come to me. God will wipe away every tear from their eye. Now, once they're sealed, the 144,000 are sealed, and these great multitude are now mentioned. Whether they're alive still or not at this moment, I kind of think they might, might have died in the Great Tribulation, but were forgiven before they died, were washed before they died, because now they're in white robes. But whatever, God's aware of these people. <laughs> God's aware. He's aware of you. He will be aware of you in a time like that. So after the Great Tribulation, after the heavenly signs of Revelation 6, we have all these people who are repenting, and God is 
corralling, so to speak. These are my people. Hang on, angels. Don't start hurting the earth and all that and really socking them with the seven last plagues, the seven trumpet plagues, until I seal them, the 144,000. And then on top of that, a great multitude were standing forever before the throne of God. Some of you think it's only 144,000 in the first resurrection. How do you read the rest of chapter 7 and come up with that? Anyway, Revelation 8, verses 1 to 3. And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And then, finally, the seven last trumpets are about ready to sound. So what's the positive angle? Have you picked it up? Hope so. Here it is. Yeah, it's going to be tough. It's going to be very immoral. It's going to be perilous. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be a time of persecution. It's going to be a time of pain. It's going to be a time of separation from loved ones. It's going to be a time of death. Coming up! And yet somehow, as in the days of Noah, God took care of his own. He put eight people into a big boat. If any of you have a chance to go see that ark that they built over in northern Kentucky, you should go see it. I don't agree with all their displays and everything, but the, this, the sheer size of that thing will just astound you. And you get to walk through all three decks of it inside. Go back. Make sure you see it. Maybe we can put a picture of it or, or, or two here. The days of Noah, God said, hey, build this ark because I want to protect you and I want to protect enough animals and birds that we can keep life going after this great flood that's coming. A flood that's going to be so great that will bring up waters uh, from the depths of the planet, that I mean, from the depths of earth, that will flood this whole earth, that will catapult mountains upside down. You know Matterhorn, uh, geologically, is flipped like a bunch of pancakes upside down. The newest, the newest fossils are way down below, and the oldest ones are way at the top. You go figure that one out. Anyway, my point is, the positive angle is going to be tough, but God knows who you are, where you are, and that's up to him. And uh, no matter what, no when, for our next conscious moment, it's going to be with God. But the positive angle is even in those dark times, those of you and us who will call out to God, who will call out on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. As Peter said, that God will pour out his Holy Spirit, even in jails, even in concentration camps, even in tortured cells. God will pour out his Holy Spirit. If you're one of those people in those days and you're hearing this, remember that. Even in the face of all this evil, God's aware of his people. He put Noah and family in the ark. He put Lot in, and at least his wife initially, then the two daughters. He got them out of there too. And one night, it was sudden destruction. That was the real message Yeshua was trying to get across, that everything can wrap up so suddenly, so quickly. And you need to be ready for it. Don't look back. Don't look back on your calling. Don't be looking back on uh, what other members of your family might be doing and that you think you have to go back and try to go back to the spiritual Sodom and save them. Pray for them, yes. But once the time comes to go, you've you got to go. And Lot and his daughters, though, were saved. I think if you go back to Philippian, I mean to Revelation 3, verse 11 and 12, uh, it talks about the Philadelphian church there. And it looks to me like they were very well could be saved in a place of safety or protected in a place of safety. But boy, don't look to that as your main goal. Stop it. That's just plain wrong. It's a big mistake some of you are making, looking to that place of safety. Big mistake. Looking to the rapture. Big mistake. If there is a rapture, which I don't think there is, in the way you all believe it, some of you, if there is a place of safety, you know how I'm best likely going to get there? By when he comes, he finds me so doing. He finds me working. When he looks down at me and you, that he finds us seeking him, repenting, praying, studying his word, talking about his word. And those who love God spoke often one to another. Malachi 3, 16, something like that. They spoke often to one another. That's what he wants. And he'll take care of us even if taking care of us means some of us will die. Paul died, Peter died, Jesus died. Why should we all be left out of that? 
So what you need to be focused on, are you ready? What we focus on from now on is loving, obeying, coming to know your Savior. Paul said that was his great goal in Philippians 3, verse 8, 9, 10. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection. Philippians 3, verses 8 to 11. Go back and read that. And to know your father intimately. Come to love him as a loving daddy. Understand him. Ask to be overflowing with his very presence in you. Ask him for more wisdom. Ask him for more of the Holy Spirit. And then coming to deeply, deeply love everyone else on this planet, like your, everyone else who's your neighbor, your brother, as a loving brother and sister, no matter what they've done or said or how they treat you. Sometimes I've come to hate people. I've got to admit it. And I've had to repent of that. There, I, uh, I'm being persecuted by some. So what's new, right? So what I've got to do is get on my knees and say, Father, would you bless so-and-so? Would you forgive so-and-so? Would you bring them joy and happiness and fill them with your Holy Spirit and have, have there be a reconciliation in her heart for those that she hates or those who hate me or whatever? I can't be hating people. Because the two great commandments are to love God with all your heart, soul, being, and mind, and heart. Everything you've got. And the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, we're supposed to love each other as Christ loved us. That even when we hurt him, he's saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what, he do, what they do. So we need to... Uh, I, I see on Facebook, you guys, a lot of you on Facebook... Sometimes I've done it. We start name-calling. We start being disrespectful to government people. Pray for them. Sure, a lot of things I don't like that the far left does. I, I don't like it. No need for calling people out in horrible names. That's not loving your neighbor as yourself. That's not honoring those who are over you. That's not praying for all in authority. That's certainly not loving them. So, brethren, it's time to wake up. Me too. i got to wake up too. Time may be a lot shorter than we think. And even if it isn't, be ready. Therefore, watch and be ready. Don't get ready. Be ready. For he comes at a time we think not. But he will know what we're doing. And if we're seeking him with all our hearts, yeah, there's an ark. There's a pulling out of Sodom. There's, he's aware of us. God will provide for his people. Okay? So a positive angle. As in the days of Noah. God knows who you are, where you are. He'll take care of you. And he'll pour out his spirit on those who call out to him. Father in heaven, we come before you and we just pray in Jesus' name that you will please just pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us and all those listening. Just pour out an anointing on all of them. Just fill them with your, just touch their head with your own anointing, Father. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. Help us to see you and know you no matter what's going on around us. Help, it's so hard sometimes to not worry, but help us to quit worrying and to start focusing on you when things are tough and bad. Me too, Father. I need so much of that too. I can worry. I can fear. I don't want to be that way in my my brethren don't want to be that way. Your children don't want to be that way. Help us to trust, trust, trust. Help us to have faith in you. Not faith in faith, but to have faith in you. To have faith in you. And know that you're in our hearts. Know that you're watching over us. Know that you put your guardian angels over us. Let's just know that. That just like you took care of, of, of Noah and his family and Lot and some of his family, thank you so much for just this word that you've given us. We commit all this now to you in Jesus' name, in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. There you have it. <laughs> Until next time. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and his incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation 
also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.